Welcome back to Think That. This is American Issues, take one. Uh, we are joined by uh, Chris Marvin, um, who is a gun violence expert on the mainland. Can I say that? Uh, that's what he spends his time on. Tim Apicella, who is the regular host of the show, is a co-host today. Uh, Chuck Crumpton, who appears on a number of our shows on legal and constitutional issues. Uh, and uh, Sarah Catino, who lives in Alaska, who is a, a lawyer in Alaska for the Legal Aid Society there, had, who appeared on a show like two or three years ago here at Think Tech uh, on gun control, of course. So let's begin with you, Chris. Um, Marvin Strategies, um, you know, you follow this uh, on a regular basis, and I wonder if you could give us, you know, a sort of a brief answer to the question. Are we winning or losing the battle um, against gun violence? I think that the data would tell us that we're losing, right? That, you know, every year gun deaths increase, um, you know, on nearly 50,000 um, at last count every year are dying. Uh, in the last couple of years, guns have become the leading cause of death for children and teens in the United States. So if, if that isn't a sign of, of losing uh, from an outcome standpoint, I, I don't know what else would be. Uh, at the same time, you know, we saw last summer, summer before last, rather, the uh, the first sort of major federal legislation on gun safety and gun violence prevention passed out of out of Congress. Um, it didn't do much for states who are already sort of doing doing a good job of, of protecting their citizens from from gun violence. But for states that aren't, there was some important things done. Uh, and then, of course, on the heels of that, the Supreme Court made a decision in the Bruin case, uh, which basically told states that previously hadn't been issuing very many concealed carry licenses that they had to issue, move from, from a may issue to a shall issue um, situation. And that in and of itself was problematic, but the aftermath is still unclear on Bruin. I think that is at the sort of the center of a lot of the, the arguments we're seeing today um, because of something that Justice Thomas wrote about uh, a historical standard that was required. Um, and I think um, we may discuss that further further today, but that that has caused all types of different um, uh, challenges to certain laws, um, but it also could, ha you know, have a, a, a positive effect for uh, for the gun safety movement as well. So that that sort of remains to be seen. But uh, that's that's kind of where we are as we wrap up the summer of 2023 here. Mm, okay, well, you know, Tim in Hawaii, we we really haven't had a lot of gun violence. We had some, but not much. And the Bruin case uh, sort of unleashed um, this <laughs> this whole group of people who wanted to carry guns around. Um, was that a good thing for us? We would have been better off, um, you know, with with sovereignty, don't you think? The bottom line is the number of gun accidents and or shootings are increasing in Honolulu. Um, the hospitals would reflect that as far as a statistical basis. Um, is it a good thing? No, it's not a good thing. But it's, you know, it's a Supreme Court decision that... Um, that the governor and the mayor are going to have to try to make sense of in this state. And um, in my mind, there could be controls. Uh, and they may be challenged in court uh, and then uh, eventually get back to the Supreme Court. You know, I'm, I'm reminded of Washington State. I think it was Governor uh, Jay Inslee. Um, they just put a, restrict on a restriction on if you own an AR-15, which is to say, you know, a semi-automatic rifle, um, very popular with school shootings, as you know. Um, those weapons cannot be transferred to anyone else. So you they, you cannot sell them in the state of Washington. So once you buy it, you own it and you can't get rid of it. So that was an interesting take on um, a form of gun regulation that I have never heard of before. So, um, so each state has to contend with a uh, Supreme Court decision and each state will have to contend on how, whether it be a gun-free zone or not, and uh, to what degree uh, weapons would not be allowed in certain institutions or in the proximity of certain institutions. I'm thinking of schools and as, as I think about that. So, um, you know, the battle goes on. It's, it's, a, it's a chessboard move. You move uh, one step forward and then there's a Supreme Court decision or another court decision that takes you two steps back. What's going on with the Supreme Court, Chuck? You know, do they not see all these killings? Do they not see the children being shot down in school? Uh, what motivates them? Uh, surely there's something wrong with them, the way they're operating. You know, you raise a really good point, Jay, because in virtually every area of the law, whether it's housing or education or 
even property rights, things like that. Health and safety beats everything. That's the ace in the deck. When it comes to gun control, they don't even mention it. They don't deal with it. They are completely blinded to it, despite the fact that former Supreme Court Justice Warren Berger decades ago told them that's not what the Second Amendment says. It says it's for a well-regulated militia, which means, A, militia protection, not individual versus individual, and two, regulated. The other factor that brings up, which State Supreme Court Justice Sabrina McKenna and former law school dean here, Avi Seufer, brought up in a constitutional law presentation last week, is that states can set higher standards. Whether California or Hawaii or other states decide to set higher standards for health and safety, public health and safety, relating to guns is really a question that hasn't been legally addressed yet. Uh, well, hope so. That would be a good issue, wouldn't it? I'd like to see that happen. Uh, Sarah, you've had the benefit of living here in Hawaii and participating in our panel some years ago, and now uh, you're a, um, uh, a legal aid uh, lawyer in Alaska, which is a red state. And I wonder, you must have a lot of thoughts about this, uh, especially uh, because legal aid deals with, um, you know, uh, domestic abuse, and we know that domestic abuse uh, uh, often involves uh, shootings with guns. And in fact, that's what's going up the Supreme Court in the Lahimi case. Uh, so I wonder if you could speak about that, and from your vantage, uh, having been in both states, and your vantage especially now being in Alaska. About five years ago, we we organized the March for Our Lives um, out in Hawaii and Oahu at the Capitol there, and you know all the all the youth kind of across the nation were pretty energized and really excited and felt after the Parkland shooting that maybe we you know some change would be made. Um, I'm also of the generation that I got to you know vote for Obama first, and we thought you know things things can change and progress. Um, and in the five years since I've left Hawaii, uh, it's definitely, um, you know, I, I follow the news and, uh, you know, shootings have gone up and it, it's obvious it's a little scary, but unsurprising. Um, and then coming to Alaska, you know, I left Hawaii to go to law school. Um, I came here, I deal with like you said, domestic violence are, uh, is rampant in a lot of our cases. Um, I live in a red state that happens to not only have the highest um, rates of gun deaths uh, in the nation, but also the highest rates of domestic violence um, in our nation. The, um, we know that here in Alaska that uh, women are killed at a 10 times higher rate um, or at a, the highest rate in the country by men. Um, indigenous Alaskan women are killed at a 10 times higher rate than their white counterparts. Um, and uh, a quarter or more of those deaths are caused by guns. Um, so the domestic violence element is, you know, it's paramount in a, in a place, um, you know, like Alaska. And I would imagine, I, I don't know off the top of my head, the rates for similar things, um, like in the kingdom of Hawaii, but we know that a lot of times in the colonized areas, um, domestic violence rates um, and violence perpetuated against women and especially indigenous women um, is a lot higher than, than say, I grew up in New Jersey um, that has pretty strict gun laws. Uh, here in Alaska, I could walk down the street, I could buy a gun, um, and then I could carry it with me. And no questions, you know, and very easy. Whereas where I grew up, that is unheard of. Um, and, you know, you could still get one, obviously, in New Jersey, um, but the rates of gun deaths are way less than in a place like here where everyone seems to have one. You know, Chris, uh, this, this case um, going to, I think it's out of Florida, Lahimi, um, where this uh, fellow um, had a history of domestic violence and, um, the state uh, didn't want to give him the right to uh, have a gun, and he took that up, and it's uh, on the way to the Supreme Court. What in the world are they going to do with that? Um, that? That is very troubling because the stats 
show you that he's the perfect candidate for a shooting in a domestic violence setting. What are they going to do with that? No, I mean, I think they're either going to tell us that, you know, they're going to apply the standard of Bruin and say that, you know, hey, domestic abusers, domestic, you know, people convicted of domestic violence felonies uh, were not restricted from owning firearms in, you know, at the time the Constitution was ratified, right? So if that's what it was, that's what we're stuck with forever and ever. That is the language that came out of the Bruin case from Justice Thomas. Um, and, and, and again, there this case is finding one way in which that is applicable. Um, and so they may tell us effectively that the Second Amendment, you know, allows for, uh, you know, everybody to have guns all the time everywhere, no, no questions asked, no restrictions. And, uh, and that's a pretty scary state. That's, that's been the gun lobby's agenda for the last 40 years, though. So they're, they're, they're winning on that. Um, I, you know, what, what we, we mentioned earlier what Ju uh, Justice Berger said, and I, I don't think it was on the bench, but he, had, he, he came back and said, this is meant for a well-regulated militia. Um, you know, the Heller case in 2008, um, Justice, Justice, the Heller case basically said that, hey, the Second Amendment extends to individuals. It clarified that, right? And, and to, primarily to protect their own home and their family. Um, but in it, Scalia said, and Justice Scalia, who's you know notoriously conservative, right, but said that th there are limitations on gun ownership um, under the Second Amendment. Now, what the Bruin case did was expand that Heller decision from saying, hey, you can protect your household and have a gun in your house to you can have a gun in public, right? And so states that weren't allowing that effectively are now forced to allow that. Um, but that that historical standard was something that sort of threw a lot of people off. I think what is curious about the historical standard is that how long will it take the gun safety movement to apply the idea that AR-15s didn't exist when the Constitution was ratified, therefore they are not covered in the Second Amendment based on historical standard, right? That um, that there are a lot of laws in place that are permissive for gun use that that were not um, applicable or, or even conceivable. Um, internet sales are not regulated by the Second Amendment one way or the other. And so internet sales of guns are illegal because we didn't have the internet in the 18th century, right? And so, you know, I, I, I don't know exactly what type of argument will be concocted, but I'm hoping that like the, the this particular domestic violence case is so ridiculous, right? Like that so many Americans agree that if you, if you are a domestic abuser, you shouldn't have access to a gun. If there's a restraining order against you, you shouldn't be able to get a gun. Um, and that has been sort of the 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 standard for for so many for all of our lives, right? And and, and beyond. And so um hopefully that'll actually, as scary as this case is, hopefully it'll knock some sense into folks at, at, at the Supreme Court and allow us to 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 track back to some some common sense regulation of guns to make sure that the most dangerous people um are somehow restricted from having access to firearms. You know, Tim, and I was saying before the show that I I don't understand, maybe you can help me, why people are so you know, fixed on guns. It's not a religious issue. You could say that uh, abortion is a religious issue. Um, it's, a, it's a strange interpretation of the Second Amendment, which uh, Chuck has made clear, isn't clear. In fact, um, you know, it really doesn't apply, uh, depending on how you treat the punctuation in the Second Amendment. So, uh, and then, of course, you talk about uh, the gun lobby. How big actually is the gun lobby? Uh, how much money is it making? It's probably nothing compared to Facebook, Meta, um, or for that matter, X, Twitter, um, or you know, uh, Microsoft, uh, or Google. It's nothing. It's, it's peanuts. And yet somehow it has this huge influence in Congress and in state legislat state legislatures. How how come it's not the money? They don't make that much money. Um, what is it that makes these people so dedicated to, um, you know, arming every citizen? Well, Jay, it's the base. It's you're right. It's, the NRA is not making that much money, uh, but their influence is great and wide. And it's the base. And we talk about religion, <laughs> and religion and guns go hand in hand. I think Barack Obama got in big trouble in that. Uh, back in 2007, when he, you know, compared um, guns and religion, um, and you know, he, he almost lost 
the, the nomination and, and the election because of his comments. So gun ownership is religion. And I go specifically to the castle doctrine. And that is, you know, everyone has a right to protect their castle and those inhabitants inside the castle. And that's where you get the point of a, a, a very feverish emotion about restrictions of gun ownership. And uh, that's where you start. But where it's gotten out of hand is um, the the influence that politicians um, have with this topic. And specifically, I'm talking about falling in line to what the NRA, uh, NRA wants. And with, every time we talk about the NRA or anything else, it's, it's the lobbying dollars. How much money is uh, greasing the palms of our politicians to stymie Congress and to make sure nothing happens with gun regulation? Um, I see a, a, a real intersect of, of conflict between red flag laws and this Rahimi case. Um, you know, you, you are accused of domestic violence and you've been given restrictive orders, and yet you're going to give someone the right to carry an arm. And at the same time, you have red flag, red flag laws that say, hey, this individual is not of the right state of mind and those arms should be confiscated. Uh, talk about an intersection. Chuck, I'm I'm troubled with the state of the law. If there's one thing that represents complete irrationality, it's standing by and seeing children by the dozens, by the hundreds, um, shot down in cold blood in schools. That is really not a statement of the American ethic or morality. Um, what do we need to do to fix this? If we just wait, is that okay? If we just wait and and hope that the younger generation, Sarah's generation, will come along and fix things in all these state legislatures and in Congress. Um, should we have, how about this? Should we have an amendment to the Constitution that repeals the Second Amendment? How about that? Um, um, you know, so, or changes it. And, and I wonder what your thoughts are about a legal solution to this. And you can add, by the way, that there are some states which are actually turning right now as we speak. I don't know if that offers a lot of optimism, um, but what are, what are the options here? Well, it's a great question, and I think it's timely. This week, in fact, Monday, it was the 60th anniversary of the March on Washington. And if there's anything that it showed us, it is that mass mobilization of incredibly differentiated, diverse groups from all sectors of the society can have influence on policy. They, following that, the next year, we had the Civil Rights Act. <clears throat> the following year, we had voting rights, both of which have been substantially eroded. But Chris makes a really good point because that history and tradition doctrine is not there in Supreme Court jurisprudence. It's not there in the Constitution. It's not even there in the common law. It was created out of whole cloth. So we have not only ignorance, but intentional dishonesty. This stuff is intellectually dishonest. And it was used in Dobbs, it was used in Bruin for a specific political purpose by a specific political group. And I'm sorry, but my sense is as a 60s guy, unless we really see effective, continuous mass mobilization, we're not gonna see the level of influence over the fear, intimidation, <clears throat> money, and power sector that has maintained the dominance that Chris talks about. Mm, Sarah, <clears throat> you know that there are arguments going on. At least that's better than having a rock-solid um, <clears throat> anti-gun control uh, legislature or governor, what have you. They are arguing about it. Do, do you see a, a light at the end of the tunnel here? Do you see a change happening in this country? Do you see a change happening in Alaska? You know, it's a great cut question, and I, I try not to be um, pessimistic. And my mom always tells me when I'm like, nothing's changing, and I start to get discouraged. And she's like, you know, you don't know. Maybe they're just not born yet. Maybe it'll be the next person. You know, maybe it's a baby somewhere that's going to grow up and, and have the, you know, the skill to change the world. Um I'm I'm with Chuck. I think that mass mobilization is what it's going to take. Um, when the Supreme Court overturned, you know, our right to abortion last summer, um, and I was sitting home studying for the bar exam, and I was like, 
who needs the bar exam? I'm going to the street. I was living in Rhode Island. I went immediately to the Capitol and so many other women and men just, you know, went to work and, and went to school and we did not, you know, excuse the language, but raise hell in the streets like we should have um, and should still be doing. I mean, things are going on in this country that are so outside of realm of, of normal and, and what we stand for, or at least claim that we stand for, you know, and, and we have, I don't want to say that we've allowed it. I think that it's easy to feel discouraged um, and feel like, you know, yes, there's conversations, but what's actually happening? Um, I was annoyed. I was like, the Justice Department, they're asking the Supreme Court to discuss this. We know what's going to happen. You know, why even give them, you know, punt the ball to them? They're, you know, what's going to go on next? Um, on you know, you suggest the that the street protests that existed a few years ago uh, that motivated you and many others um, have declined, and that you don't see the street protests you saw after some of these uh, mass shootings. Um, now people sort of get complacent about it. They treat it as the normal, and they don't get out on the street anymore. Am I right? Largely. I mean, we haven't even, we've been talking for 25 minutes. We haven't even touched on Jacksonville. Um, you know, that just was three four days ago, you know, a white supremacist gunman went into Dollar General and, and killed people senselessly for no reason. Um, we're almost numb to it. It's it's secondary on the news these days. Um, but I can't be totally discouraged because like you said, you know, we're still talking about it. It hasn't ended. People do care. Um, I live in a super duper red state where you could talk to people that say, no, we totally, it's crazy that we could just have an AR-15. There's no reason, you know, don't take my guns, but I don't need all of them. You know, there, there's there gotta be some sort of middle ground, I guess. I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful, <laughs> hopefully optimistic, if, if you will. <laughs> Chris, I wanna ask you a question I think you must think about. And that is, uh, and we've touched on it here, the strange connection between you know, all these right-wing issues is the people who are lockstep about abortion are lockstep about guns, and vice versa. Um, although they're really different, they're completely <clears throat> different issues, and yet the lockstep is visible every time it comes up, the very same people. And of course, it's the, the Trump movement people, it's the extreme right-wing people, it's the base as we try to define it. But what is it that makes people do that? connect all the right-wing issues and stay absolutely locked on them, including guns, which is the most irrational of all. Well, I, I, I could spend longer talking about this. I won't, but I will tell you that it, it is a deep irony or or, or uh, just a, a sad fact that you have a group that calls themselves pro-life that is also pro-gun. Guns are death, right? Guns cause death. And and as I mentioned, the leading cause of, de of death for children and teens in the United States is guns. And so I'm not sure how, what, how those folks justify their position on abortion and their position on guns at the same time. Um, but, uh, in, in, you know, I think that what we really need to think about when we talk about sort of the conservative movement and, and all those things being connected probably since the late 70s, the reaction to row, the rise of the evangelical movement in the, in, in, inside conservative politics and and the, the Cincinnati revolt and the NRA and the, the, the gun lobby being taken over by the gun industry. Um, all of those things happened, uh, you know, about 40 years ago. And so, um, you know, what what we see now is is sort of culture war. Um, and so when we talk about these protests, when we talk about policy, which is what we spend most of this time talking about, um, there's, there's a huge cultural element here as well. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, the, the, the idea that we can shift people's ideas around guns, the role they play in their life, um, is the win that we need to be shooting for now. Um, this idea that people store their guns safely, this idea that people, um, you know, can urge their members of Congress to pass a law like background checks on all gun sales at the federal level that is a, that is uh, supported by 95% of Americans, right? But we can't get it through Congress. So um, if we can if we can get folks to um to to think about knowing that they need we all need to act to keep guns out of the hands of dangerous people um and we need to take all steps necessary to do that and that that doesn't infringe on an individual's 
right to, you know, in Alaska to own that AR-15 or whatever it is, if they do it responsibly, um, then I think that we could make some progress on the laws, but we first have to make progress on the culture. Tim, uh, Sarah called us out for not discussing the, uh, uh, the, the Florida mass murder a few days ago, which was racially motivated and several people died. Um, what about that? What's your reaction to that? I mean, I guess I can take from what she said, her reaction is, why, why didn't we act? We're numb. Uh, why didn't we have something in the street? Is there nobody who cares anymore? Um, this is going to happen on a weekly basis. And indeed, uh, right after that happened, we had this shooting. It wasn't a mass shooting, but it was a shooting at the uh, University of North Carolina, which is national news. It's like the guns are everywhere and they're being used. Um, what do these incidents tell us? Well, it, it comes down to numbers. If 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 the shooting wasn't uh, a hate crime, I'm not sure we would have heard about it um, because there's mass shootings taking place all over this country, and we're not hearing about it. Uh, certainly three uh, doesn't warrant the, the first page or the headlines of national news or even, well, it'll make it state, state news. It'll make that, but not national news. And, um, you know, again, if it wasn't a hate crime, we probably wouldn't even heard of it. And so what's that say about how Americans are desensitized to this issue of of school shootings and, and uh, mass shootings? Uh, we're desensitized to it. Uh, you know, if this was Parkland, that was a different time. And it was, you know, it was a different time for the horrific nature of these mass shootings. But uh, be as it may, when you hear these these stories every day on the news and in the paper, um, the human mind becomes numb to it. And I think that's unfortunately where where we're at as a nation. And how do you how do you become unsensitized or desensitized? And I don't have an answer for that. I think our psychologists are going to have to work on that one, and our sociologists are going to have to work on that one. How about the media? What can the media do to work on that one? Well, the bottom line is. They are talking about the horrific shootings, um, and those go. Those, you know, if it's a you know if it's a number over thirty, uh, we'll see a story for two days on it. But um, they're doing what they do. If it if it bleeds, it leads, and that's what the media does. Um, again, I, I sincerely doubt we would have heard about three people being shot uh, and killed senselessly in a murder, but. We did hear about it because in this specific case in Jacksonville, it was uh, what appears to be a, a distinct and uh, overt hate crime. You know, just to go back to you for a minute, Chris, you know, there used to be a time when we were led to believe that these mass shooters were doing it to, to memorialize themselves. They were doing it um, to get their name in the paper. Uh, I'm not sure that still exists, but I wonder if you have thoughts about that. Uh, if we treated it differently somehow in the media, maybe they wouldn't see an opportunity to be famous. Yeah, I, I, I think that we also used to play video games and violent movies and things like that. And we yeah, we did say that we thought that folks wanted to see their name in the paper, even if they sort of were deceased, they wanted to leave that that mark. There's, um, uh, you, you know, to, to, to Tim's point, Jacksonville wasn't a mass shooting by definition. You need you need to have four deaths, not including the shooter, to qualify as a mass shooting. It's just the number they the line they drew. But we have had 400 mass shootings in this country in 2023. Stop for a second. It's it's not yet September. We've had 400 mass shootings. So how many have you heard of? Right. So I think Tim's exactly right. The Jacksonville is is, is a hate crime. Right. So um, and it was per perpetrated by a gun. Guns allow people who want to per perpetrate hate crimes to do it more successfully. They allow people who want to die by suicide to do it more successfully. They allow people who want to um, harm their spouse in a domestic abuse situation to do it more successfully. Um, and I think that the same thing comes for for, for mass shooters. They're, they're angry people who are trying to take something out. They, they may have, you know, obviously mental health issues, et cetera, but they can easily, if they can easily acquire a gun, whatever manifestation of what they're dealing with becomes a shooting or a mass shooting because of the access to the gun. So, um, you know, that's, that's, I, I, I attended the gun sense university, which is every time for gun safety moms demand actions, um, annual meeting. I attended that in Chicago this just last month and, um, they handed out buttons and those buttons said, 
Um, it's the guns. That's what I said. It's the guns. And at the end of the day, that's what it is. We can talk about again the video games or the notoriety or the mental health or um, or society. All of those things combined, and then you give them guns. That's the that's the part. That's the part of the formula that, that leads to death. And if it's death we're trying to prevent, it's the guns that we need to focus on. Sarah, Chris hasn't mentioned suicides. If you put guns in the hands of what hundreds of millions of people, it's going to increase the number of suicides too, because guns are such a great way to do suicide. Your thoughts? I think definitely. I I, I know definitely um, that we know again here in Alaska that suicide is is a higher rate than in other places, and that people you know do that with a gun. Um, we also know that people that choose to die by suicide. Um, sometimes have regrets afterwards um, once they've maybe taken some pills or, or, or taken that final step um, where they say, oh no, you don't get that with a gun. You know, there's no option to kind of walk that back. Um, you could be, you know, in a really bad place and think that this is your only option. Um, and then it, and then it's done and, and you can't, you know, save that person and um, yeah. It's a shame because I do think even if it took 15, you know, times to help save that person, it's worth it every time. Um, and taking away that that chance just really, it's unfortunate. Chuck, I'm always looking to you for a, a creative legal solution. Okay, um, and the two come to mind. Uh, one is to hold the gun manufacturers responsible for their advertising uh, and their their propaganda and their lobbying, for that matter. Um, is there any chance that we could stop uh, or ameliorate this problem by going after the gun manufacturers? Well, there is a case on its way up to the Supreme Court that poses that question. Illinois and California and other states have expanded gun manufacturers' liability exposure for this. It, but I come back to the thought that maybe what we learned from the March on Washington is that it really requires sustained, overwhelming mass mobilization, not just hit the money sources in their pocketbooks. Because underneath it, Chris is exactly right. There's a culture to this, there's a psychology to this, and it's based on fear. That is what the leadership of that group has fed on and has cultivated. And the flip side of fear is anger. And that's what you see when you combine anger with a gun. 400 of those this year, as Chris points out. So until we start to mobilize people against that fear, against that anger, and to disconnect them from the guns, I don't know that we're going to see change through legal theories. Well, assuming that um, Sarah's generation and generations uh, you know, coming up after her, uh, get really excited about this. What do you th think about the prospect of adopting the Australian New Zealand so you know, solution? You buy them back, and if they don't want to sell it to you, you put them in jail. Simple. Um, could that ever happen in this country? Well, <clears throat> think about another approach. Instead of thinking about environments where you want to protect public health and safety, and you want to exclude guns, <clears throat> flip that on its head and say, okay, show me an environment where you can justify having a gun because the established historical and traditional demonstration of danger to life and health and safety is so great that only a gun will provide sufficient protection, that you can't do it with security or any other lesser means. What if we flip that standard on its head? Okay. Reaction, Chris? I mean, it's an argument that I've tried to have with, with gun uh, gun rights advocates. It is is basically like, okay, you are leaning on the Second Amendment, right? Like everything is the Second Amendment and the Supreme Court decisions that are interpretations of the Second Amendment. Let's let's make the, let's pretend the Second Amendment doesn't exist, or let's pretend that it's been uh, repealed, uh, and and let's 
make your argument. Why, why when, and where d does who need guns, right? It's not everywhere for everybody all the time. So, so where would you put in restrictions? And, and I think that there's, there are enough common sense gun owners, like gun owners per se are not the, the enemy here. Um, and we, we saw it in Hawaii when we were doing the sensitive places laws. Um, that, that for most people agree that we shouldn't have guns in bars. If you're serving alcohol, maybe just, you know, and you have a concealed carry permit, just don't bring your gun in, right? Um, and you need to lock it in your car um, and that you shouldn't have it on playgrounds or schools. Um, of course, you know, we recently had a federal judge overturn the idea that we can't have guns on beaches, um, which are public parks, right? And so we're still working on that one. And, and you know, it's going to go up the up the chain of sort of federal judiciary. But um but you know there there are gun owners here in Hawaii. There are gun owners elsewhere who are are able to have that conversation, um, and and try to justify their need for guns. Now they there's a, their opinion will always exceed mine, uh, um, but hopefully there's a happy medium in there because right now we're not experiencing the happy medium. It's it's uh, it, it, let's let's remember that for their argument is all guns ever all the time for everybody. Our argument is respect the Second Amendment, let responsible gun owners own their guns, but let's keep hands guns out of the hands of dangerous people. Where are we, the gun safety movement? We're in the middle already, if not beyond the middle. Um, so let's 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 bring this back to it's it, this is where no one's trying to take away anybody's guns. No one's trying to do the Australia thing. Um, it's not feasible right now. Um, but uh, and, and it's not a slippery slope to that either. Um, there's too many guns out there, but um, the government can't afford to buy them back. <laughs> but but let's let's understand what the middle road argument actually looks like, and it's the argument that the gun safety movement is making today. Okay, well, I you know I I'm looking down into the future because I don't think there's an immediate solution to any of this. Um, and Sarah, I I want to just pose a situation to you where we have a new generation come up, and they really care about this. Um, and they're not only out in the streets, they're um, at the ballot box. Um, and they are using their credit cards to uh, support candidates they like in other states, other races. Um, and they, what they could say is, look, this is very important to us. And if you don't do gun control, if that is not on your platform, we will never, ever, ever vote for you. Never. We want you out. We're going to kick you out. If you don't uh, do gun control, you think this is possible going forward? Again, I'll be hopefully optimistic there. I, th I think that it is possible. I think that, um, you know, if some of these politicians would just retire already, to put it nicely, um, and if my generation stood up, you know, at the rates that they are and even higher, because there's much, you know, we have seen an increase, but there's also a lot more of us. Um, and I think that they're much more, you know, sensible. And it might be more in line with Chris's argument of, you know, maybe not everybody needs all of them as opposed to the nobody gets any. Um, you know, I, I'd be happy for the middle ground if we were at least working towards that. Um, if we had an Australian model, I don't, you know, do I see that happening next week? No. Um, is it possible? Anything's possible. You know what troubles me, Chuck, more than more than anything, really, is that the base and the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers and all that, they have guns. Even now, they have guns. And if uh, a, an autocrat uh, like uh, Trump gets into office uh, or tries um, and activates them and says, I want you guys out in the street and I want you to do violence on my opponents, um, you have a, hmm, it's not a militia, it's an army. Uh, that will respond to him. And if people don't talk about this, but it, since it's politicized, what you have is an army that responds to political leadership. Does that concern you at all? It does, but think about this. Look at the youths in Montana who took a provision in the state constitution that said, you have a right to a clean and healthy environment. And they enforce that against the abuse of that right by the failure to institute a protective environmental factors, which are health and safety factors. What if we actually got courts to start protecting the right of future generations and current generations to a safe and healthy environment, not just a clean and healthy environment? And, and you put that up against gun bearing rights and gun use rights, and put it to the test of what 
if you elevate the public health and safety to a constitutionally protected right, where does that take us? Well, hopefully to a better place. But the question is, when? Uh, so, Tim, uh, we don't have time to go around the table and last comments, but let me ask you that. How emergent is this issue? Is this something we can kick down the road, or is this something we need to address right now? Well, I think you heard Chris say it best. Uh, we have 400 mass shootings in 2023. Um, if not now, when? So the bottom line is, in my opinion, you have to figure out a way to reverse uh, Citizens United, the Supreme Court decision that put dark money in the hands of politicians who are voting right now against their constituents' best interest. And until you do that, until you address the money problem in Congress, no social issue is going to get solved, be it gun regulation, um, a whole host of the environment, global warming. Nothing's going to get solved as long as politicians' palms are being greased. Thank you. And you said that from Portugal. All right. Uh, now let's go to Chris. Chris, you have the unenviable position of summarizing all of this and making final comments. OK, go for it. I, I do, I'll do. i take one quick second to address the question that you asked to, to Chuck about um, the, the Proud Boys and the Three Percenters in the base and then ha them having guns. That whole idea that they're going to, the, the Second Amendment allows you to stand up against uh, 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 the, the government. Look, our military's got drones, so you can have all the Air-15s you want, but we got the drones and the tanks and the, and the plane. So <laughs> I, this, this, I, you know, I, I get veterans involved in this movement, right? That's my primary job, and I'm an Army veteran myself, a combat veteran. So, so let's let's call a spade a spade there. But, um, but I think that you know that argument aside, I opened with this. I said it in the middle, and I'll say it at the end. Guns are the leading cause of death for children and teens in the United States. Not cancer, not car accidents. Um, if 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 Sandy Hook didn't do it for you, if Parkland didn't do it for you, if Covenant in Nashville didn't do it for you, it's not about the mass shootings. Mass shootings are actually a small portion of what what they just you know the gun deaths in America. They just get the attention. Um, kids are dying every day, every single day by various means, but the the lethal means is always a gun. Um, and as long as it's a leading cause of death for our children, it's something that we need to be taking real action on. Um, and that that should be enough for anybody, no matter what your ideological persuasion is. Chris Marvin, Marvin Strategies, joining us from the mainland. Where are you? Where, where are you, Chris? No, I'm in Honolulu. Oh, I'm in Honolulu. wonderful. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and uh, Chuck Crumpton, joining us from what? Makiki. Makiki, I'm sorry. <laughs> and, and Sarah's joining us from somewhere in Alaska. Where was it? Yeah, I'm in Kodiak, Alaska. So oh, yeah. I'm envying your weather there on Oahu. <laughs> Thank you all for this very interesting discussion, and, and I'm sure the issue is not yet resolved, and we can, we will circle back to it later. Thank you all. Aloha. Mm -hmm.